Thank you very much, Stefan. Mari Cross, member of the Institute. Stefan, you have advocated that we, we try to develop, uh, along with Mrs. Mogherini's plans, uh, more strategic and uh, effective um, uh, CSDP and, um, and military capabilities. And uh, indeed, the, uh, the Foreign Affairs Council and, and uh, Ministers for Defence have taken more active steps in this regard than they have for very many years uh, over the development. Uh, could I ask you uh, to just look at, um, at uh, the EU uh, developments in this regard and NATO? I mean, to, to a large extent, there's quite a bit of competition between the development of EU capabilities and NATO, uh, and what NATO is, uh, the NATO objectives, because effectively you are drawing on the same forces. And do you feel that NATO inhibits the development of uh, EU uh, foreign policy strategy or EU at least military capability development? Because forces are, uh, are finite uh, even when they're developing towards the, the 2%. Well, uh, should I answer? Yeah. yeah. Uh, historically, of course, you're totally right. I mean, the fact that uh, for a long time this part of uh, foreign policy could not develop at all was based on the fight between the Atlanticists and the Europeans, between the UK and, and France. It's only in Saint Malo, finally, this uh, division was overcome. Uh, and uh, clearly, there are still countries, particularly in Central Europe, uh, but also the Netherlands, that are putting most of their eggs into the NATO basket. But I think uh, probably also the Trump factor could lead to a situation where uh, this notion of strategic autonomy, which was thought of being rather eccentric when Mogherini put it in, as gains actually credibility and support in the EU. Uh, I think NATO will continue to be the primary factor for European security, but I think its emphasis will remain very much on territorial defense. So the anxiety, the concerns about potential Russian aggression against the Baltics, etc., that uh, will be in the focus of NATO policies. But if you look at the uh, security challenges around Europe, a lot of it comes from uh, the Middle East, from Northern Africa, from Africa in itself. And there is probably a huge demand on uh, EU uh, training, expertise, maybe sometimes peacekeeping forces, potentially sometimes even some kind of a more robust intervention, uh, which where well, NATO is unlikely to be the, the preferred uh, instrument. So I think this is never really discussed out front. People avoid it to, to, to be very open about it. But I see some kind of division of labor uh, with uh, NATO continuing to focusing primarily on Eastern Europe and territorial defense, and uh, Europe focus, uh, EU focusing more on the uh, not very heavy duty, but but still important and necessary engagement, uh, capacity building, training, etc., in Northern Africa. And I think that is, should be really the focus of the capacity development that is happening at the moment. Done. Uh, thank you. You mentioned the WTO and the risk of trade wars. Um, I, I wondered, though, maybe I misinterpreted, but that perhaps you um, haven't given it enough importance, given the the, the, the the really um, vital link that it is both in transatlantic relations and for the, the management of the transatlantic economy. And also, I think, pretty much inarguable that the WTO is the most effective multilateral global institution uh, as a rules-based effective uh, uh, institution. Is, is that not something that needs to maybe go higher up in the priorities um, of, uh, of, of Europe, protecting the WTO? keeping the U.S. on board. Thank you. Well, my sense is a little bit that at the moment uh, Europe is waiting to see what the policy will really look like, hmm? because uh, so far we don't know. Uh, if you can judge uh, it by the tweets, it's going to be horrible, <laughs> absolutely. But we know there were also horrible tweets on NATO, <laughs> and it didn't happen. Uh, and if you look at the, the team, uh, 
again, it's very mixed. There is uh, Mr. Navarro, uh, who is a very eccentric economist with an extremely protectionist agenda, but there are also these Wall Street guys, <laughs> who are, I'm sure, quite much more open on, on trade, and who will win the president's ear on these issues and actually define policy is unclear. I think there has been a paper on, on renegotiating NAFTA, which is surprisingly mm. uh, weak in terms of substance, it's not radical in terms yeah. of substance. And the key question will be probably, uh, is the president, is the administration ready to work within the WTO framework or will they uh, somehow try to dismantle it or simply uh, impose their policies beyond it? I think that's the key question. And I think that will be also on the agenda today with, with Mr. Xi. But uh, I think at this point, point uh, it is taken very seriously. It's a huge concern. It can really brutally damage uh, EU, the EU's economy. Uh, but at stage, we don't know yet what the policies will actually be. Uh, thank you uh, for a very um, discouraging <laughs> review no. of the situation. You said um, that, that to develop a foreign policy that's, that measures up to our need, it needs a change in mindset. Many years ago, wrestling with fiscal policy problems in Ireland, I was hoping to, to get a change in public mindset. And a very senior civil servant said to me, Minister, when I'm told that this just needs people to change the way they see things, I know it's never going to happen. <laughs> You're in a country uh, that has a mindset that is absolutely allergic to any coherent development of foreign policy in the EU. You're a native of a country that has almost the same uh, allergy. I remember asking uh, an Austrian ambassador here a good many years ago, what was the Austrian definition of neutrality? And she produced to me very quickly 15 separate, very learned theses on 15 different ways of looking at neutrality, all of which were as much nonsense as the Irish position <laughs> has always been. But I think there is an enormous job to do uh, to get not even the populations, but the political systems in the member states to see a coherent value in a coherent EU foreign policy. And if I may say so, I think part of the confusion uh, is illustrated by the debate, the discussion you've just been having about NATO. Uh, personally, I think that all of the EU uh, military or military-related adventures have been posited on a refusal to believe that the system that's in place that engages the armed forces of most member states is the only one that uses armed forces. Uh, I mean, I, I don't see how you can argue that there should be two sources of instruction for the armed forces of the member states. There should certainly be a variety of instruction, but they have to come from the same place in, in the governmental structure. So if we're going to have a military capability of any kind to be coordinated by the EU, NATO is the only instrument we can use. And history shows us that. Ireland, for example, participated in military operations in the Baltic because there was a UN mandate. The UN, which didn't have the resources to do it, asked the Western European Union to take, to take charge. The Western European Union said, well, we don't actually exist, so we'll, get, we'll delegate the task to NATO. And Ireland ended up participating in a NATO operation in the Balkans. Now, that was just a piece of absolute nonsense. We, we by accident managed to get an effective result, but the way of getting there was absolutely contorted and wasteful. And I think that un until our systems recognize that reality, we're doomed to have an absolutely futile military half floor on the, on the European construction. Uh, and I think that I see no reason yet uh, to, to expect that we will be so appalled by what Trump does that we'll actually do so, something sensible together. So I'm pessimistic, <laughs> as well, you might guess. I think you're too pessimistic. <laughs> I, I think what... Uh, it's very clear that the kind of 27 working together 
that's a very dysfunctional approach to do things. But what <laughs> strikes me as interesting uh, in my talks with my colleagues in Brussels, they say the one country that now pushes more than anybody else on that front in terms of doing these little things so, is Germany. And uh, what I could imagine is that uh, France and Germany together, uh, if they realize that they will have more responsibility for the security of the regions, for uh, measures to take also in North Africa, uh, not unrelated to sort of also the migration threat and uh, things like that, uh, that uh, these two core countries uh, can move together much more closely. Recently, I think three weeks ago, there was an announcement of a German-French deal for much closer cooperation. And they probably will prefer, rather than doing it just the two of them, to have some sort of a core of European countries around them. And there is this concept of PESCO, the Permanent Enhanced Structured Cooperation in the Lisbon Treaty, which allows some countries, if not everybody wants to go, on the basis of, of criteria to, to move forward together. And this can be done not through unanimity, but also qual qualified majority vote. And this is now being elaborated, and Mogherini is supposed to make a proposal how to carry this out. I think this is an area where uh, probably some degree of flexibility, allowing some to participate and others not, will be necessary. But it strikes me that uh, there will be a real need for military activity uh, in North Africa, Middle East, possibly also in parts of Eastern Europe, and not on all of the issues, NATO will be the right organization. Some issues, the US might not want to be part of the scene. So I, I think that the, uh, the demand is there, and there seem to be some serious European politicians in Paris and, and Berlin ready to push in this direction. So I, I see the difficulties, but I also see uh, the political will, at least, of some important people to, to confront these difficulties. But not Abraham, the <laughs> No, 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 that. Uh, Noel member of the Institute. Uh, <laughs> Stefan, if we go back to Dan O'Brien's, the subject Dan O'Brien raised, not, not specifically WTO, but more generally, our whole uh, capacity to, by our, I mean the European Union, our whole capacity to negotiate with the Americans on trade and economic issues. Now, unlike uh, the broader foreign policy side, we have a well-established and well-respected, and I know this from the five years I spent in Washington, a well-respected uh, structure there led by the Commission with the involvement of the member states. Now, what's your feeling about the chances of that structure standing up to the kind of challenge we might get a little bit like the kind of challenges we had with, with Reagan in the 80s, where if a US president who takes individual squabbles over individual trade issues, blows them up on tweet, and puts pressure on member states, the, the, the system works now because the member states cooperate with the Commission, do you think the Commission is in shape to, to maintain the discipline and to be able to deal with that kind of situation from what you've seen in Brussels recently? Well, I think, as you Thank say, you. Uh, the, the different thing from most other areas is the competencies of the commissions are very strong, basically. And now you have this dispute between Germany and, and the US about the dumping, uh, steel dumping fines that are being imposed. And the, uh, Germany obviously respects the fact that it's the commission that has to trigger, trigger WTO action to do it. So I think the US administration, uh, to, they, they should know, but to the extent they don't know yet, they will find out very clearly that on this issue, they have to talk primarily to, to Brussels itself. And, and I don't see, ultimately, I think professionals will prevail in, 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 in the handling of the issue. But I think, of course, the Commission needs the backup of, of the big member states to make the case. Uh, Jerry Fitzgerald, a member of the Institute, and I'm coming from a military background. Um, and I'm recalling uh, the attempts of cohesion in Europe. You're talking about the, the pooling and sharing that we've had, we've, uh, the battle groups that we've had. And, um, and I must say, I, must, I share Alan Jones' uh, pessimism about the future. But I wonder if you would comment on uh, previous comments that we've heard about a European army and the likelihood of such 
That's my first question. And my second question is totally different, totally diverse. I wonder as a, if you would give us your, your, your best view on the, the purpose and strategy behind the most recent bombing that has taken place in Syria, mm -hmm. the US bombing. Yeah. On the European army, I, I think it's a dream, basically. I, I don't understand what rights uh, Mr. Juncker for <laughs> bringing this up uh, again and again. Uh, I think uh, the European army uh, requires a European government, basically. It requires a federal structure, and that is over and dead. Uh, I think that's very clear that uh, the concept of uh, federal Europe probably died uh, with the fall of the Berlin Wall. This, uh, uh, at this moment, I think the EU became too big and too heterogeneous. Uh, the Eastern enlargement was necessary uh, to stabilize the region, but uh, you can't, uh, on that basis, build a federal Europe. Uh, and therefore also not the European army. Uh, it's evident that whatever happens, whatever emerges ultimately will, will be uh, a structure that still requires uh, the decisions of the individual countries on, on, on the employment of military force. Uh, on the bombing yesterday, I can speculate, only speculate. Uh, as I said, it is in a way in total contradiction to what Trump stands for, because this is not the protection of U.S. interests, which he says is the beginning and the end of future U.S. Uh, foreign and military policy. Uh, I think it is a basically a, an attempt to show that uh, Trump is different from Obama. So the chemical weapons have been used, uh, Obama failed, Trump succeeds. It's as simple as that. It's, it's part of the public relations exercise. And it, in terms of follow-up, I think it will be a very isolated step. I think the administration has already clarified this. This will not be a bombing campaign now against Assad. Uh, this is actually exactly what Obama should have done then, because I think I understand very well that the U.S. administration didn't want to get involved into, in the war, basically, and there was no public support in, in America for moving in this direction. But they could easily have done exactly the same kind of sort of symbolic step to show that the red line cannot be crossed without consequences. Uh, but uh, I, I think it is not going to affect uh, the Syrian war in a very significant way. No. Uh, there will not be a much stronger U.S. engagement now in the future. I think there will be a bit of a Russian fuss, and they are angry and they are annoyed. But again, I don't think this rules out future deal-making between Trump and Putin. Uh, it's not a world-changing event, but it is a significant development. Well, uh, thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, could I, um, in, in summing up, um, pick out two of the um, guidelines for the future that you mentioned, um, safeguarding international order and defending liberal values. I, I think we should not underestimate the weight that the uh, EU can bring to bear on these questions. And indeed on even wider reaching questions um, such as the you know, regulation of international trade, the international, uh, regulation of international production and this kind of thing. Uh, I, I was uh, reading recently, for instance, that the, uh, the system called REACH, which is regulation of the chemical industry, mm -hmm is a very strong point which, uh, which the uh, EU can bring its weight to bear decisively on international questions. And indeed the same goes I think for, uh, and you mentioned it, uh, climate change and for the environment more generally. Uh, and it also goes I think for uh, the United Nations system uh, which I think we can have a decisive weight on. So let's not uh, uh, undervalue ourselves too much. At the same time, um, I uh, would come back to the point I made earlier, uh, how Donald Trump can save EU foreign policy. It, it's up to us to do it, and uh, it's a case of um, something that used to be mentioned a lot 20 or 30 years ago, political will. I mean, political will is one of those uh, notions, uh, I think Alan Dukes referred to it, if you say political will is needed, it means you can forget about it. But, <laughs> 
What disturbs me finally about the whole thing is one of the last things you mentioned, and that is the contingency this year of what will happen in the French elections and what will happen in the German elections. Now, the German elections are perhaps uh, somewhat uh, less worrying, but the French election is really worrying because if the French election goes the wrong way, I think we can forget about our uh, oh, yeah, European yes, yes. Union undertaking, and that is a frightening thought. So on that basis, thank you very much for provoking all this thought. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming here and for giving us the benefit of your thinking on these matters.